And a very good evening, everyone. Welcome into your box seat. Brought to you in association with Sweet Lou, standing at Woodlands. A uh, couple of venues for the box seat tonight due to the inclement weather. I hope it hasn't affected you too much. Let's head north to Auckland, where, well, there hasn't been a whole lot of fun weather-wise up there, Michael Guerin. Very good evening to you. Uh, off the back of what was a fantastic race night at Addington, Derby night. Hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. I sure did, mate. Um, good evening to everybody around the country. You've got my own little studio here tonight, Greg. It's quite nice. Not having you around for a while, but I feel like I'm king of my own castle. Sheriff was king at Addington on Friday night. It was a wonderful derby, Greg. One of the best derbies I've ever seen on either side of the Tasman. And um, it's topical this week because the last two derby winners before Sheriff are also very much in the news. We'll discuss them a little bit later on. And also, Greg, a chance tonight to catch up with Mike Godba from the RIU about this relative spate of drug positives recently, where he sees drug enforcement in the industry, and some questions which maybe have been floating around the minds of people, something we don't discuss a lot on this show, Greg. Later on, Mike Godbar talking about drugs and performance-enhancing substances in harness racing. Look forward to that, Michael. I reckon this could be the best race I've seen since the 2001 at a Dominion Grand Final. The Diamond Creek Farm New Zealand Derby of 2018. The front row uh, gave a clear indication that most of them would want to get to the markers and wait for one of the better performed runners, or certainly those in the market off the second row. So a hot speed was set up early. Brent Mangos led forward with Cole Pecker. We thought that would happen. He probably didn't expect Nathan Purden to uh, drive as hard on duplicated and hold the lead. And then, of course, Michael, a uh, mid back straight move in the first lap from John Dunn who sees the opportunity with Ulta Maestro to grab the lead with a horse who uh, generally races best in that position. That set up a lead time of 1.10 and what ultimately became a national record. Just goes to show Greg that often just takes one or in this case two drivers with some ambition and, and who like to be at the front end of the field and all of a sudden the dynamic of a race can change enormously. Duplicated leads for the first lap and you know, anybody could have come and got the lead off them. It could have been sedate. As it was, it was a fantastic first lap. Really rolling along here. As you said, the lead time very, very quick. Once they got to this point, and very shortly they'll get to the mile point, and they had gone this quick, Greg, you only wanted to be on the horses in the second half of the field. And derbies in this country are so dominated by horses on the marker pegs, but this was one that always stacked up to be dominated by the swoopers. Here's the first of those in Pat's Delight. Initially, Greg, I thought that Dexter Dunn erred by not pressing on for the lead. As it turned out, he drove the horse absolutely inch perfectly. Then he's followed, as we expected, by Sheriff, by Anthem and by Sicario. It was serious early, Greg, and they did not let up. No, they didn't. Blair Orange, you saw him have a good look about the 1,300 metre mark. Will I go? Won't I go? As you've quite rightly pointed out on several occasions, Michael, to beat the All-Stars, you need to be in front of them, and that's exactly where he got to. Anthem pressed him very hard. Ulta Maestro uh, put out the white flag, and, and Sheriff hit the lead. But we'll hear from Blair Orange just at, at the stage of the race where he got around to park, he was absolutely flat out. I think, in many ways, Anthem aided him, Greg. Anthem pressuring him there made Blair, he had no choice, he had to go forward. As you said, if you want to beat the All-Stars, you've got to get in front of them. And that saw Sheriff break Ulta Maestro, change the complexion of the race, put Pat's delight into the trail, and left Anthem parked. If Blair lets Anthem go, Anthem gets in front of him, and there's the potential Sicario gets him around them as well. But right now, everybody's totally exhausted, and being on the marker pegs at this point and not covering that ground is crucial. Here, I thought Pat's delight was going to get to Sheriff. Here's the last 200 metres of a wonderful New Zealand derby. Getting through on the inside from Sicario. Sheriff leads, margin ahead. Pat's delight, still Sheriff. Pat's delight coming. Here's the post. Sheriff, Sheriff wanted a nose. What a derby. Sheriff beat Pat's delight and Sicario. I think they've gone an amazing time here, Blair, close to 3.05, and this horse has had every reason to get beaten tonight, but just proved how good he is. Yeah, I think, you know, the, the draw played a big part, Greg, starting out of that um, first lap, and, 
you know, they really run hard right to the mile. And, you know, when Dick's weird and I thought, you know, we're still running a bit, but, um, you know, when Mark's team came, I, I had to move in front of them. And, you know, he had to be good, Greg, because we were flat out a lap out, mate, and, you know, he staffed off some lovely three-year-olds and, you know, Nigel's had him peaking for the day, so, um, you know, great night. 50 metres off the line, it appeared that Pat's delight may have even headed you, so for this horse to come back just shows you what a tough customer he is. Yeah, look, I didn't actually know it was Dex that popped down to me back around the corner and until he shot up the inside, mate, and, yeah, he came very fast, but, um, you know, it was a good battle up the straight between the two of us, but um, luckily the coin flipped my way. It's been an incredible year, season-wise, for you, uh, with the number of wins you've had, but to win a derby must be something very special. I know you've done it in the north, but winning the New Zealand derby is a big thing. For sure, you know, and I know Nigel's never won this race, and neither have I, so, uh, you know, to be blunt, Greg, I stuffed it up in the Great Northern Derby, and it's just great to reward the owners tonight for the, with the victory. Congratulations, mate, well done. Cheers, Gregor. Yeah, so a big moment for Blair Orange, but also for Nigel McGrath. He'd gone so close in the Northern Derby before, but the raw emotion from him and uh, part owner Graham Byrne and the other owners, they, they were over the moon, Michael. It's a big thing to win a derby. Yeah, and it's a big thing to win a derby with the horse who two weeks ago had a minor setback. So Nigel had to not panic at that stage, Greg. It was a popular victory. Um, Nigel's taken the challenge of buying good horses at the sales, and this horse is bred on that golden cross, the better's delight across a Christian Cullen mare. He's always been good at training these young horses, but you get the feeling, Greg, and I don't mean to overstate this, there's a little bit of Lazarus about this horse in his body shape and in his strength. I mean, not saying he's going to go on to be Lazarus because that's an incredibly rare occurrence in harness racing, but I wouldn't be surprised if he turns into a good open class horse. I liked your interview with Graham Byrne afterwards. He's a guy who's put a lot of money into the game, both punting as a sponsor and as an owner. And that shot there, Greg, summed up the harness racing season for me. Dexter and Blair out in front as they have been on the Premiership. Still friends, regardless of who wins. So many layers to this, Greg. It was a feel-good story. And the other drivers played their role in that race, Greg. They made it an interesting race by saying, hey, I've got a good horse. I'm going to play here. And everybody played. So many other good performances behind them. Pat's delight was significantly better than its previous start. Sicario was still good. Probably not as good as he was at Auckland in comparison with some of the other horses. Anthem may be a touch disappointing, and on the cards I thought was fantastic after getting wide over that last lap. But one of those races, Greg, where you could have finished 8th, ninth, or 10th, and you'll come out next start and win because a fantastic derby full of fantastic performances. Of course, uh, bred by the Spices, uh, the chairman of Harness Race New Zealand, Ken, and his wife, uh, Anne-Marie, so a special moment for them. Uh, and to Pauline Gillen, Bob Macefield, uh, and of course, Jeff Deakins, along with Graham Byrne, uh, an enormous night. What about those just in behind what was probably, uh, without doubt, the race of the year? Well, Dex, you've gone at a short margin, but he's pretty brave. Yeah, it was a really good um, run, Matt, you know, um, didn't go down by much, but... Uh, you know, he's, uh, he's always been a nice horse and, yeah, Crane's got to improve a lot in last start and he needed to and he performed well. What was going through your mind pre-race knowing how he went last start? Um, I wasn't too worried about it. He'd come through that pretty well and we knew he was going to be better tonight. So, um, yeah, I thought there'd be a bit of action early that much. So I didn't think, um, you know, they were really running early. So, uh, yeah, I mean, we went in with an open mind, but, you know, I knew he was uh, confident enough to have a horse to, um, you know, run like he did. Did it cross your mind to burn out of the gate at the start? Um, it's one of those ones, I knew there'd be probably a bit of speed inside of us and probably a little bit outside, so um, a sort of position and hopefully we'd find a handy spot, uh, you know, it would have worked out a ride and luckily it did. Mark, you're in the same boat as many with a tricky draw, what did you make of his efforts? I was pleased with his effort, you know, he was back last there and, and, and got, got a nice drag into the race, but for the speed they went, uh, you know, he was three wide for a good part of the race and, uh, you know, it was a good effort to run third. With the three-year-olds you lined up in the derby tonight, are, are they all on the same path toward the jewels? Uh, yes, all the ones that race tonight uh, are on that path, yep. Well, Zachary, what did you make of the run? Hey, look, he's gone super, you know. Uh, I've said a couple of times Northern Hemisphere, so he's probably a little bit weak, but to go uh, the time they did, you know, he got a good run, he just flattened out halfway up, but he kept flying the line, you know, so pretty proud of the wee fella, and he'll get better again in six months. Driving out there, did it feel as though they were going 3-5? It did a wee bit, you know, not, not ballistic. Down the back we got running again, but, 
I guess, you know, nice horses, they're getting quicker and quicker and they can just do it these days. So don't get me wrong, we did feel like we are running, but, you know, at the end of the day, the good ones will do it, won't they? Never going to be easy from the draw. What did you make of it? I thought he went OK. Look, he had his chance. He probably had as tough a run as Sheriff and Sheriff well and truly beat him. So, you know, he had his chance. He was just OK. So Anthem, uh, subject of a, a large number of bets on him, Michael, uh, slightly disappointing. Of course, Chase Auckland's come out of the harness jewels. That means now Sheriff will wear, uh, wear the yellow jersey. Spoke to Nigel McGrath about uh, where we're likely to see him next. He said, look, when we went to Auckland for the sales series, he had one run into that and he went very good. Same thing for the Northern Derby and then again for the New Zealand Derby. So he'll have a run at the second of the Premier Nights at Addington before heading for uh, the Cambridge Harness Jewels and that'll do it for him this season. Yeah, Greg, I think Anthem might turn up at the Jewels. Uh, I'm not sure he's been officially withdrawn, but I, uh, I finally got around to ringing Mark Purden on Sunday. Greg, I had left him alone for a month just so I didn't have to talk to him and vice versa. But East Anthem's the one who's unlikely to hit there. That, that hasn't been confirmed as of yet, so he's still in the market. Not sure he's a, a miler anyway, but yeah, with Sheriff, it's exciting, Greg, for, for Nigel and Blair heading forward to have a horse like him, because even if he doesn't win the New Zealand Cup this year, and we'll talk shortly about this year's New Zealand Cup, he's a New Zealand Cup horse, and once you've got a horse who's in, role, in play for that, you're in play for Inter-Dominions and those sort of things over the next couple of years. So exciting for Graham and the other owners as well. I think a lot of people enjoyed that derby, Greg. We've had a lot of derbies in the last five years which have been dominated by odds-on chances. Just goes to show you, sometimes if you put a lot of the good horses off the back line, it's better racing, which does make you wonder, not for the classics, but for other, other races about preferential barrier draws and how maybe they're the best way to get fair racing in the grades and probably more even betting markets, Greg. Yeah, well, to be fair, Michael, that was as close uh, as you would get to a pref draw, just the way the numbers uh, fell. It wasn't the only derby on the night, of course. Uh, the second of them was for the Trotters. This is the Inkwise New Zealand Trotting Derby and another very good contest uh, set up uh, for a swooper and it was the filly, Luby Lou, in the yellow colours launching uh, wide out on the track for Mark Purden and she did this to them. Two lengths on Winterfell, then Majestic Man. It played right into her hands. Toot toot the three wide train. First carriage back in a derby for Luby Lou has beaten home Winterfell. Majestic Man ran third, Majestic Hurricane ran fourth. Mark, I know you agonised over the winner's starter in the derby, but clearly you got that right. <laughs> yeah, well, she got a beautiful trip too, Greg, and. Uh... Oh, you know, she, she was just cruising around the home turn. I sort of came out on the corner, but oh, she'd, she'd gathered the bumps sort of in the straight in 20 metres. Mark, you decided after she beat Renez May, who went on and won the Breeders' Crown, that no, it's time to turn her out, let her develop, and, well, that's well and truly been vindicated now. Yeah, that's right. She was just at a point where, you know, she, things could have gone wrong with her, and uh, this, this time round she's a lot more mature and, uh, and a lot more solid in the gate. Phillies have had a good record in the last six or seven years in the race, and... The ones that have won it, Habibdi's gone on with it, and obviously SKP, who you know well, um, she's got it all ahead of her now. Oh, she has. She's a great gated trotter and, uh, you know, royally bred, and, you know, she's got everything going for her. Congratulations to you, Mark. I think it's half a dozen in this race for you driving wise, so well done. Yeah, thanks very much, Greg. Well, he was pretty brave, Nat. Oh, he was very good. Um, probably, you know, if I had got around to park, it would have made it very interesting. But, you know, when he was caught out there three wide, he never gave it up, and, you know, he's still learning a bit, so I think, you know, he's got a bright future. Well, Brad, you had a bit of confidence to put him in the race, and he's rewarded you with a great effort. Yeah, that's right, Matt. Uh, you know, he showed a lot of ability uh, as a two-year-old with a uh, big season that he had. So tonight we felt like we were back close to that form, so we had a crack, and um, yeah, he held on and went a really nice race. Do you feel as though there's still improvement in him? Yeah, for sure, Matt. Uh, he was quite sweated up after the preliminary, and then that false start again uh, probably wasn't the ideal situation first up. So I think he'll take a lot of improvement from that, basing on you know how uh, fractious he was in the running and things like that. Good effort from a maiden, Blair. Yeah, pretty good, Matt. You know he's uh, he's having to come off the unruly, and you know, he gets really aggressive in his racing, and you know does take a bit out of himself. So you know, all in all, pretty happy to run fourth, mate. Are you going to head to the jewels with them? Yeah, look, he'll head up to um, up, up north for those couple of races before the jewels at Auckland through their premier carnivals and uh, all going well, hopefully get the jewels. But he's probably going to need a bit more money in the bank yet. But, um, you know, we'll just, just keep pressing on. Sheree Zazoe, talk me through your run. 
Yeah, no, she went good, Matt. I mean, come out of the gate nice and um, it was actually travelling very well. And when um, Brad had come round, it took a wee bit to sort of get her back for him to um, get the 1 1 position. And I thought she um, finished, finished the race really nice. I was really happy with her. So great to get the insight from those uh, in behind Luby Lou. I thought Winterfell was outstanding. The one that was disappointing in the race, Michael, uh, Paramount King, obviously there was something amiss there because he got the right cart into it following the eventual winner. Yeah, he underperformed. Um, I think maybe he had a touch of a virus or something. I spoke to John after the race. He said they were going to get a blood test taken on him and stable mate girls on film, rowdy in the first, score up, galloped straight after the second one. Very deep crop, this Greg, but Luby Lou's the best of them, clearly, at the moment. She's obviously very high class, bred to be good. I think they'll be tempted to race on with her, go to the jewels, obviously the North Island races, and then maybe the Breeders' Crown, because it's split boys and girls, which means she wouldn't have to take on Wobbly, who might come here for the jewels. She would just take on the girls over there. Could probably race in their derby, but she's the best of them, Greg. I think Winterfell, they might not go to a breeder's crown type race with him. He's a little bit like Stent Greg. I think he's a very good horse, but he's probably going to be a better four-year-old than a three-year-old, and there's plenty of depth out of this, Greg. These are horses who sometimes these derbies, as we see the owners, Ken and Karen Brecken, um, are won by decent horses, but there's a few maidens in there, Greg. I think basically there were almost no maidens in there apart from Majestic Hurricane. So. It's going to be a deep old crop and interesting time, but Luby Lou's title to lose at the moment. Yeah, the uh, six of the best syndicate having uh, a lot of fun uh, with her, and we look forward to seeing uh, uh, a lot more from her in the upcoming uh, months. Uh, Michael, speaking of derbies, last season's derby winner, dual derby winner, uh, Vincent, some pretty big news on the four-time Group 1 winner. Yeah, it's a shame. Greg, he's been retired, obviously. Alabar, in uh, cooperation with Neville R, have bought his breeding rights. They were looking potentially to, to race him again next season with Gene and Bill Feast, but they gave him the stem cell injections and basically just didn't pan out the way they wanted to, and it was more risky to go forward with him. He won the Auckland Cup, of course. He won 19, or had 19 starts for 16 wins, two placings. The other one, he was knocked out of the race. Gee, he was a good horse, Greg. We're not going to see the best of him. I think we're, we're learning as we see his Auckland Cup win there that, you know, this is how the gallops people feel all the time, Greg. Their best young horses get retired and they don't get to see them so often if they are in tyres. But, yeah, disappointing. H had he been up against Lazarus in the New Zealand Cup in November and then into an Inter-Dominion and maybe a Miracle Mile, who knows what heights he would have got to. But he's going to a good home, Greg. He's incredibly commercial as a stallion because he can be crossed with the Betters Delight Mares and there's 1,500 Betters Delight Broodmares in Australasia. Uh, Mark III, Christian Cullen and some beach somewhere. So I think Alibar have done a smart thing getting him. He's an art major. He's going to leave nice big stock. I reckon they'll stand him around 5,000, Greg. And I'd be stunned if he doesn't get 200 mares the first year. So um, that's Vincent. So farewell to him. A lot of conjecture around what's going to happen with Lazarus at the moment. Greg, I've made a few phone calls. It's all very secretive. And I can understand the owners wanting to be that way for reasons of commercial sensibility. Um, you know, it's, it's sensitive when people are making big money offers. This is the best information I can come up with, Greg, and I'm not sure this is exactly right because people are keeping things under wraps. There has been an offer made by Alabar, which would potentially be involving other studs in New Zealand and Australia, that would see the horse, providing he's physically well, Greg, race on next season in a dual ownership between the current owners and the studs and then Laz would be retired to start eventually. So that's one offer. The other offer is not from Woodlands, so it hasn't come from the other major New Zealand stud. It has come from what I understand to be a US-based syndicate or consortium, whatever word you want to use for that. Now, Greg, that would raise two possibilities, that Lazarus went to the US, where he would need to race if he wanted to be a dual hemisphere stallion, or he would be retired to stud straight away. The other option would be racing in New Zealand under that ownership, but that would seem less likely. Um, I'm not sure how it's going to pan out, Greg. I would like to see him race on here next season. 
but money talks and it's not our money we're playing with Greg or the fans in the harness racing industry so I have no idea which way they'll go that's the best version of the information I can come up with Greg but there's a lot of rumours swirling around as they tend to be with these things in harness racing um, I'm not going to get too involved in that Greg because it's none of our business all right, we'll head to a break here on your box seat. When we return, there's still Group 1 action to review from Addington Raceway and the return of a Group 1 star. Yes, back winning, Speeding Spur. Back into your box seat, uh, third of our Group 1s out of Addington Raceway. It was the French Shaw Memorial Trotting Championship. Deep field, interesting race, and speeding spur led at this point, but there were a whole lot of things to happen in the next couple of hundred metres. Anheim, Harrod of Mott's galloped on the lane. The leader, speeding spur, Anheim's galloped. Destiny Jones, Temporale, speeding spur. Anheim comes again, speeding spur. What a race. Speeding spur and nose Enhein in a photo. Destiny. Yeah, he, he went great tonight. This horse, he sort of had to work in front, and um, you know, it's sometimes it can just be a little bit of a bad thing drawing handy. You sort of got to do the work in front, and he sort of had to do a lot of that this season, and and it's been hard work for him, I think. And um, like we've always thought he's a bit better off the pace, so maybe later on in these other Group Ones, we might be able to drive him that way. Josh, it's great to have him back in Group 1 winning form. He's been such a magnificent horse, and I know you want to play a lot of credit to your father here. Oh, for sure. Um, Dad's done a great job. You know, this horse, is, um, he's had his fair share of um, ups and downs, and, and you know, to, to get him back to Group 1 winning form is um, absolutely outstanding. Well, things didn't roll your way in the derby. They certainly have here in the Trotting Championships. Congratulations to you, mate. Well done. Yeah, cheers, Greg. Just if I can, a good friend of mine, Tony Cameron at home, unfortunately lost his brother through the week and just want to pass on my best to um, Tony and his family and let them know we're all thinking about him. Nice work, mate. Well done. Cheers. Yeah, a touch of sentiment there from Josh Dickey as well. And, and our thoughts are with you, Tony, too. Uh, of course, a long-time employee of uh, the Tony Hulahi barn and, and a tough time for he and his family. But speeding spur, maybe uh, fortuitous and getting back into Group 1 winning form, Michael, but uh, great to have him there just the same. It is. Um, Pids himself in the conversation, Greg, for Trotter of the Year, I suppose. He's you know, now got this major win and a, a win two weeks ago under his belt. Oh, I would think he would need to win an Anzac Cup or a Road Cup to get over the top of Temperale, who was, was all right there without being great. Two things. First of all, the winner was brave and he's a determined horse. I don't think he's at the level he was two years ago, but... Let's not hide from the elephant in the room here. Ingheim was just enormous. I mean, he's galloped at the start. He's never seemed comfortable. He's galloped in the home straight, and he's still only gone down by a nose, Greg. At the moment, Ingheim is racing better than all of these horses, but without the manners and the ring craft he needs. But it's hard to make the case, Greg, if he doesn't, if he gives his best, as we see, Speeding Spur there, Dell Boy as they call him, having a bit of a, a relaxing day the day after, Grego. But if Engheim can get to his best, and they reckon he's better around Alexandra Park, you can make a very strong case, Greg. He deserves to be favourite for the Anzac Cup and the Row Cup, which is the first of those Friday week and the one Friday after that. Yeah, and importantly, Michael, with finishing second there in the Trotting Championship, uh, he's uh, elevated himself uh, well into the harness duels. As you quite rightly pointed out last week, he will be a hot favourite for that. Uh, Ricky May, yep, he had the audacity to uh, gallop uh, on more than a couple of occasions, if you count the start as well, and a couple of gallops in the straight, and he still just got beaten. So I, I think you're right, Michael. I think uh, if he gets it right and the right way round at Alexandra Park, you'd think he would, uh, He's going to take some beating. Could be a race between the last two winners of that division of the Jewels because Ingheim won it last year, of course, at Ashburton. 
The year before was won by Custodian, very much a forgotten horse, Greg. Now, the connections of Custodian have said we 100% want to come to the jewels. Now, we've had a lot of disappointments in the past with Australian horses saying they want to come to the jewels or the connections of, and then they're not turning up. But they have said, no, no, that's our big game for the season. So Custodian could well come back here. Greg Ingham, I think, has probably gone well past Custodian as a horse, but Custodian is very well mannered, has a lot of gate speed, so it'd be good to see him back here, and that would be a real rarity, um, the two-year-old trotting division winner versus the three-year-old trotting division winner, both in going for their second duels as four-year-olds, but Greg, there'd be no doubt to be the top of that market, which does raise an interesting question. Markets for the duels were opened in Australia last week, um, but they're not open here, and that doesn't quite gel well with me, Greg, to be completely honest. Well, not when they're hosted here, so uh, I'm sure they'll be getting a wriggle on there in Petoni, and hopefully we'll see something in the near future. Uh, Destiny Jones was really good getting a placing at Group 1 level too, so congratulations uh, to the connections there. Uh, welcome stakes, Group 2 level. Uh, another good edition of this. It was robbed a little bit with the uh, scratchings early of the day of the hot favourite four. It didn't change the result in terms of which stable uh, won it. Another masterpiece for Tim Williams getting home. Uh, War Dan Delight was the one that was scratched earlier on. Getting it wrong, a better act. He's got a bit to do uh, with his gait, but another masterpiece was was too good. He was in for a race up the lane, but he's been aided by a gallop of the stable, mate. Congratulations, Tim. He's a professional racehorse, this guy, and he thoroughly deserved that. Yeah, very much so, Greg. You know, he's, he's just a pleasure to sit behind, and, you know, like you say, just each time he's stepped out, he's just got a little bit better each time, and um, he's a pleasure to sit behind. Look, you found the front pretty comfortably. Uh, race rival and closest to you in the market, a better act. Were you concerned at all when he moved up alongside at the top of the straight? Yeah, look, for sure. Obviously, the way he balanced up to me pretty nicely. Obviously, I hadn't asked my fella for a whole lot, but um, yeah, definitely uh, yeah, it was going to be going to be close if he had to stay in his gear, that's for sure. He's got the all-round game, though, so going forward to the bigger two-year-old races, and let's face it, the winner of the Welcome Stakes invariably goes on with it. You must be quite excited about him. Yeah, very much. Yeah, he's a, he's a very progressive type, like you say, and um, yeah, the way he's handling himself too each time, it's... Um, you know, come the big races, I'm sure he's going to stand, stand in good stead. Your first win in the Welcome Stakes. Congratulations. Thanks very much. Yeah, he was too good. He found the front and dominated from that position. Usual names in the ownerships here, the uh, Kennards, the Breckens, uh, of course, uh, the Woodhams as well, and Jim and Ann Gibbs, who I think they had three winners, uh, or part of the... Uh, the ownership of three winners at Addington. They also won a group race with Reespin the next day at Rickerton, so a good 24 hours for that uh, pair. He's got shares in, or they have, Jim and Ann, 21 horses, Greg, so are heavily involved in harness racing, of course, a legend in the galloping community, and um, look, this horse is one of the horses in the conversation, Greg. As you said, um, War Dan Destroyer, which is one of those. Delight. One of the, Delight, one of the war dads. <laughs> There's that many of them. Uh, it was scratched out of the race. And of course, Jesse Duke wasn't there either. And Jesse Duke has recovered from whatever was ailing him. And they'll both head forward to sales series and size stakes. And, I wouldn't be betting into this market at the jewels, Greg. I think there's a lot to happen here. Gate speed's going to be a factor, as, as it is going to be around Cambridge over a mile. But mm, I, I had, and when I spoke to Mark on Sunday, I don't think he thinks these horses have a defined picking order yet. So lots of chances to see who ends up on top. But at the moment, the welcome stakes belongs to this horse. And he's a lovely looking horse, Greg. Beautiful going type of a horse. A better act maybe has a similar sized motor, but not as big a brain. No, you're right there, Michael. Uh, so there's still plenty of water to go into the bridge in the two-year-old division. We look forward to seeing Jesse Duke back. Uh, two-year-old winner of the Harness Jewels was more the better. And he was able to turn the tables on the Easter Cup, a winner in AG's White Sox. Here was AG's White Sox in front. Uh, once he found this position, I thought, oh, well, he's got to be hard to beat here. Around came Mark Purden and he presses the go button, Michael. I was surprised that Rick uh, handed up to him so uh, easily, but he was coming very, very fast. Look, he was. Uh, watching this as a punter, I thought to myself, well, Ricky, what have you done here? Why have you handed up? But when he led 
three starts ago against More the Better. More the Better just crushed him sitting parked outside him. Sitting off the speed, he was able to beat him in the Easter Cup. So I think Ricky was justified in thinking his best chance was to beat him. It wasn't a lot of fun to watch as a punter. As it turned out, it wouldn't have mattered. More the better here, just cruises clear of AG's White Sox, who maybe isn't a leader. So, yep, they probably put themselves back where they were two weeks ago, Greg, although a week ago in the Easter Cup it was a different kettle of fish. So at the moment you would say not a lot between these two horses apart from the run. But, yeah, I agree with you. Watching with a lap to go, I thought, Ricky, why did you hand up? But um, clearly he's a better horse chasing, and on that occasion I think that maybe more the better is a more potent horse over the shorter trips. Not that this was a lot shorter, but it wasn't run um, hard, Greg, so it made it a race where, yeah, fair to say more the better got things his way. More the better, Greg, AG's White Sox head north to take on Star Galleria, where Jack's legends out of those four-year-old races makes it a very, very strong top end to that field, but I'm not sure how much depth there's going to be in that four-year-old field. And news coming out of Australia, Jillaby Kung Fu, they're still looking to come to the duels. I think he'd be sorely needed at the duels, Greg. I think this is going to be a duels where we're not going to have a lot of glamour horses or really big names, like a, a Lazarus of a couple of years ago, obviously no Vincent. I think Jillaby Kung Fu would be more than welcome at Cambridge. Yeah, definitely. I hope he does make it over here. He's, uh, well, the most exciting I've seen from their side uh, in a wee while. So, uh, yeah, looking forward to him hopefully heading to Cambridge. But those four-year-olds, uh, yeah, the, the numbers-wise, it might be a challenge. But, um, gee, there's some depth there. And Star Galleria is awaiting that pair amongst others. Uh, as we go to a break here on uh, your box seat, hope you're enjoying the review of Addington Raceway. Uh, the bloke up in the commentary box, really does he get things wrong? Well, he got it absolutely spot on here. Let's take in the uh, dulcet tones of Mark Mack and uh, this exquisite call uh, of the dead heat. Franco Saxon, Queen B. Barton and Franco Texas. Eamon Maguire leads their head out to Orlando. Bonnie Jones screaming to third. Eamon Maguire still in front and that's a dead I think out to Orlando's leveled up. As mentioned earlier in the program, opportunity for us to catch up with Mike Godber. So we sent uh, Michael Guerin out yesterday and had a chat to the head of the RIU. Well, Mike, thanks for joining us. There seems to be a number of relatively high profile positive cases or investigations going on at the moment. Is there anything unusual about that? Not really, Mick. They, uh, they, can, they come and go at times. Uh, we've had eight months where we haven't had a Harness positive, for example, and other times you're going to have three in three months or three in two months. So it's just, there, there's no rhyme or reason to the, you know, to the positives. Harness racing seems to have more positives or more investigations over the course of a year than thoroughbred racing. Is that actual reality? Probably in the total numbers, yes. Some of that is due, can be due to the fact that Harness horses start every week, can often start every week. Thoroughbreds obviously be three weeks. By the time you get the tests through and the positives, that horse could have started again in harness and so you could end up with two positives as opposed to the one. To, to put it in context, uh, Mick, you have something like 28,000 starters in harness racing and we test just under 5,000 of those. So 20%, one in five horses starting get tested and the end result over a year is about seven or eight positive drug tests. The biggest case everybody's talking about at the moment will be Robert and John Dunn. Now, Robert is the official trainer. John is not officially a part of the training partnership, yet they both got fined. I know it's hard to discuss the specifics of their case because they may well appeal, but 
Does that mean that somebody who is not a trainer, whether that's someone who a horse is staying with as a caretaker trainer, can be fined if a horse returns a positive? It does. It means that somebody can be charged. Just to clarify the, 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 the Robert and John Dunn case, they are, I believe they are, they are appealing. But the decision from the JCA was that the fine was 14000 and then they divided it between the two of them. If there had only been one trainer, if it had only been Robert charged, the fine would still have been 14000 and probably the JCA probably confused things a little by then dividing it by two because it looked like it was like a double charge. Harness racing has a horse movement policy which suggests if you have a horse stabled with a trainer in a different part of the country, you tell people where that horse is stabled. If I have a horse staying at my stable but I don't train it and it returns a positive, I can be charged for that. You could be, if, especially if the, if the, depends on whether, as long as the paperwork has been done correctly. I mean, in the uh, Robert and John Dunn case, one of the horses, and the name escapes me. Rishi. But, yeah, was trained by... Um, Craig and Nate Edmonds. Yeah, exactly, uh, Edmonds. Now, they had done the paperwork correctly that it was going to go into the care of uh, Robert and John, Robert Dunn, for the uh, Nelson Circuit, and may have even been for a bit longer than that. So when that produced a positive from going to the Nelson Circuit, the charge was against you know, uh, Robert Dunn because of that. And we, we charged them both because they have two stables and it was very clear and they, they were pleased, happy to, to, to explain that you know, John has the care and control of the horses in the Canterbury stable and he was taking them up to uh, Nelson. But I need to emphasise that, that the fact that we charged two people there or one, that shouldn't have made any difference to the fine. The fine was what it was. $14,000 from the JCA, that was higher than what we recommended, but it, that's what it was and it would have been whether there was, whether there was one or two. You have been in the industry uh, in, a, in a role, a variety of roles for a long time. Is there any room for gut instinct, like the local copper who says, well this guy wouldn't have done that because I've known him 30 years, can that ever come into play for you? Uh, I guess it does a, a, a little bit, uh, and I'm sure it does with everybody. People feel that. Although I do, I do remember uh, talking with Christchurch Casino people over uh, operating bars, and there's a general rule in bars that the person who you think is most least likely to be taking money from you or, or stealing alcohol is the person it probably is. So gut instincts, good to have them, but so often they sometimes prove to be false. Where do you think the industry stands at the moment in relation to performance enhancing drugs being used? We have had two major eras in the mm. past, one being the milkshaking era and a far smaller one with the now termed blue magic era. Uh, what does the data suggest to you at the moment? At the moment, uh, we seem to have, uh, I hate to say, dodged a bullet, but we, we certainly haven't had the use of cobalt that occurred in Australia. So Australia cobalt, there's a huge number of charges over the last two or three years, and, and the Australians in some degree, in, in, in our view, in my view, overreacted in some of the charges they've laid and some of the penalties, that because the stewards apply the penalties over there in the first instance in a lot of uh, the states. So we don't have that same cobalt. We've had some cobalt positives, but nowhere near the number in Australia. So yeah, I don't believe we're in a uh, sort of a, a, a period at the moment of, of, of high drug use. You raise penalty. When milkshaking first became part of the common knowledge, there were trainers who were disqualified or suspended mm. for having TCO2 positive readings. Now we seem to be almost at a stage where very few people in any code get suspended or disqualified. There tend to be a lot more fines handed out. Is that the JCA slash IRU policy? Uh, no, I, th I think if you look back, and we all remember the, the big cases, of course, where people tend to get uh, disqualified. And, and I actually checked this back with uh, a couple of the investigator, an, an investigator who was working at the time, and the first charge even in the TCO2 era, tended to be a fine. So the 
People who ended up with disqualifications, it was obvious often their second or third uh, penalty that became a disqualification. And I can recall there's one TCO2 in, in the era from when the RIU was set up, which was from 2011, where I think it was the year was the, the, the license holders either third or fourth in discretion in about 18 months, and that, that resulted in a disqualification. So disqualification usually isn't the first step. TCO2, or bicarbonate and milkshaking, we now see the readings for the horses taken pre-race um, available on your website. Trainers don't get access to the same readings for, for example, cobalt. What's the reason behind that? Uh, well, I, I suppose you could almost say that TCO2 is a bit of an anomaly that we've, al we've agreed to do that. TCO2's been around a long time, as you know, Mick. There'd be millions of tests for TCO2. And the general rule is that the range of TCO2 levels is say 28 to 32, 33. Anything over about 34, 35, you know, people have a wonder about a bit. Uh, whereas cobalt, when it was first banned in Australia, it had a level of 200, same in New Zealand. Now it's been reduced to 100. The norm, when you look at the results on cobalt, uh, anything from 1 to 20 is the usually the the normal readings. So with such a big disparity through to the, to the uh, level at which a positive uh, applies and with so little science currently available because it's only been on the banned list for two years or since 2014, sorry, Cobalt, 15 I think in New Zealand, uh, my call was that well, we're not going to put that information out because it, it can and, and there is plenty of also some good scientific information out there that cobalt is not the best for horses in, in, in quantities. So we have said, no, we won't print those figures. But what we have said is anyone who, a trainer who gets a very high reading that we see, but is under the 100, uh, then we would visit them. And when I say a high reading, it's going to be over the 70 or 75. We would go and visit them and say, is there something wrong with your feeding regime or something? So we're not there to be the trying to catch somebody who's who just makes a mistake because cobalt, funnily enough, seems to be in a lot of substances that are fed to horses. Do you think our trainers and horse people aren't well enough educated on what they are giving their horses, remedy-wise, for example, therapeutic remedies, mm -hmm. and are sometimes taking the advice of their veterinary surgeons, carte blanche? Yeah. Well, I think they, there's a need for them to take more notice of the vet. I think if in doubt, get your vet's advice, it'd be, is, is, is my, my advice to trainers. We would look at, out of our, say we get seven or eight normally a year and positives in harness racing. And in, in the other codes, if you take the other codes as well, I'd say a good two thirds of our positives are through somebody making a mistake, it's an honest, can be an honest mistake, somebody not reading the label correctly, thinking that, oh, I'll just give it this amount, or, and, and not, if in any doubt, and but they need to talk to the vet and get the veterinary vet's advice. Do you think some of the overseas states and authorities have gone too hard on the disqualifications? We have seen a large amount of disqualifications for things which you would only get fined for here, for example, in a place like New South Wales? Yeah, I think, well, if you look at the penalty system, I think our penalty system, and it varies between the codes, but basically speaking, our penalty system for presenting a horse, and this isn't administering to a horse, uh, deliberately administering a horse, this is just presenting a horse with a uh, uh, prohibited substance in its system, is up to, I think it's a $20,000 fine and uh, a dis period of disqualification. I think in uh, enhanced racing it's five years. But uh, administration, it's uh, disqualification could be for, for life if administering. And in Australia, the, the levels for presenting are higher. Uh, but yeah, I do think they have gone a bit hard. I think there's got to be also some reflection and penalty in the state levels and what people are earning because you are even when you disqualify somebody or suspend them you are removing their ability to earn money so there has to be some reflection on how much money they can earn and the penalty 
Last question for you, Mike. We do appreciate your time. We do have one investigation going on in the country at the moment, maybe not a major one, about a, a test taken away from race day, so yeah. out of race day testing. How common is that, and what's the reason behind that? Uh, that the science science uh, will tell you, and all the, the, the laboratory people will say, that is the area that there's got to be more emphasis on in terms of testing. That's uh, for testosterone cypionate, for anyone who's interested. Uh, that is the first out of competition test positive in New Zealand. Australia have only ever had a handful of positives. There's nowhere near as much testing out of competition as there is in competition, and by in competition I mean taking urine or blood after the race, on race day. But, uh, so this is the first, and there's been more emphasis on that since the equine codes required that, um, you know, matters like testosterone and that became banned substances. And so that was, um, it was important that uh, there's more testing there. So yeah, that is a, that is a first. So that was Mike Godber from the RIU, and Michael, it was uh, appropriate given the number of cases that have uh, certainly uh, come out in recent times and the ongoing ones. Interesting to hear there that one in five horses uh, gets tested, and when you extrapolate that out over an entire season, uh, the number of positives we get are, are pretty minute, really. Yeah, I think, Greg, we've had two major drug errors in harness racing in the time I've been involved. There was clearly a milkshake error at the back end of the 1980s and into the early 1990s. Everybody knows about that. And, and we had that spate of blue magic positives and, and uh, investigations 12, 13 years ago now. But at the moment, racing feels relatively clean, Greg, by the number of positives we get. We had a little bubble of them recently, but I think a lot of them, Greg, there's two words that you need to take into play here. One is a horse being presented which means it's gone to the races with drugs in its system, that's going to tend to get you a fine. And then there's administration. If they can prove or you plead guilty to administration, Greg, that's when disqualifications or suspensions start to come into play. I do think that back in the day when milkshake first came in and people got disqualified, I think with all the therapeutic remedies that are being used on horses, Greg, now, if you disqualify people carte blanche, like they tend to do in New South Wales for having a positive, I think that would be disastrous for the industry because I think a lot of people legitimately are using things either the vet told them to or they don't know how to use properly or they're using homeopathic remedies and it can give you a positive to, to something like caffeine. Do I think a lot of people are walking around the game, Greg, using performance-enhancing substances? No, I don't as best I can work it out through the patterns of racing, through betting patterns, all that sort of stuff. Over a long period of time, Greg, covering drug cases, and I cover them a lot less than I used to because it, they tend to be very wordy and they tend to not be um, that important to the general punter. The one thing I've found is this, Greg, and this is the truest thing I know about drug cases. If you like the person accused of drugging their horse, you think they're innocent, and if you don't like them, you think they're guilty. So if you and I have got a horse and we're racing it with a guy we like and he gets a positive, it's easy to go, oh, no, nah, he didn't do it, the damn RIU, and those buggers are accusing my mate. But if you don't like him, then the guy's a cheat. And it shouldn't be that way. I don't think the RIU are actively going out there trying to fabricate things. I think that if people were more willing to work with them but also be more open-minded about things, Greg, we might have a little bit less animosity. The one thing I do know we've got right is this. The separation of powers, which was about a decade ago now, where Harness Racing New Zealand no longer prosecutes these cases. I think that's crucial, Greg, because you can't run the industry and also be the chief prosecutor as well. So um, there's a lot more questions to ask about the RIU. We couldn't ask Mike about specific cases for obvious reasons. The Dunn case, for example, they're appealing the penalty. but. I do think they are open, listening to Mike there, Greg, to dialogue once there have been uh, irregularities.
All right, great to uh, have that information, and thanks for going out and doing that for us. Uh, before we head to another break and wrap the show up, uh, PGG Wrights and Uncut Gems, of course, uh, introduced last season. They'll be at Alexandra Park on the 15th of June, so uh, post the jewels. I think that makes sense, obviously, having a uh, majority of those horses eligible for that race uh, will be at the Harness Jewels. Uh, so uh, some uh, interesting news uh, coming out in regards to that. All right, we'll take a short break. When we return, well, finally, we'll be able to talk uh, with a bit of positivity around some best bets from last week and find you something to get involved in for this week. So James. here are the colours being worn for the first time to success for Matt Purvis. Yes, Max Marita. Of course, he hadn't had uh, too long in the barn. He's only just started out on his training uh, regime. So there's the green colours down the outside. John Dunn. Uh, of course, uh, Matt had worked for the Duns in the past. In fact, he'd worked for some pretty high-profile people in the game. The Hopes, uh, of course, Paul Nen and uh, John and Robert Dunn, and more recently with Nathan Williamson. So those are Matt's colours. They get their first success with Max Marita. He had placings on the day with Fun in the Dark and Miss Moppet. And of course, uh, Derby runner, Born to Run, who was unplaced uh, in that, has joined the stable as well. There he is, receiving uh, the goods from the Rungiora team. And good mate John Dunn uh, salutes for him for the first time. So well done to you, Matt. Looking forward to your progress. Uh, he's based just across the road at Ken Odges, former property of Ken Odges. I think he leases it off him. Uh, where he's trained uh, quite a few winners and does all the fast work on that track at Rangiora. So it was probably appropriate that he should get win number one there. OK, moving to uh, the Tasman, across the Tasman it would be, uh, to Australia. And it was WA Derby time, former uh, Kiwi King of Swing. That's him parked in the hall colours. Uh, he looked flat here, but he kept on kicking and he got uh, win number one at just his second start across there. Uh, wide out, out to its outside actually was Ocean Ridge who finished in fourth position so the Kiwis to the four there. Uh, Gary Hall also won with uh, expat Kiwi Liberty Rose bred by John Higgins here who beat our Angel of Harlem. Uh, she managed to finish into third position at about a 55-6 mile rate but he's a good horse king of swing. Michael Guerin and not surprised to see him deliver uh, so early on in his campaign over there. It's a shame to see him go, but of course, uh, obviously, big money would have changed hands for him, and you'd imagine he'd have a pretty good career in that part of the world, judging by the fact he was able to sit parked and win the Derby. Uh, at Melton, we saw Tornado Valley continue his incredible run of form. Admittedly, the best trotters in Victoria, Maori time potentially heading to Sweden, although I'll believe that when I see it, and sparkling success having a break as it looks to go to Yonkers of all places. But with them away, Tornado Valley just sat parked and smashed them. So Andy Gath wouldn't have paid a lot of money for this one, way too good. And then party on for Brick and Bloodstock. We had a huge weekend, Luby Lou. They also bred, of course, um, King of Swing. And they've got Party On, who lined up later in the night, Greg, in, in one of the Mears races at Melton and just smashed them. She now is actually coming home for the jewels. So she sat outside Miss Graceland, and Miss Graceland drops out there. Party On back to her best, Dean Braun training. She's going to race in the Queen of the Pacific late in May. And Greg, she will be coming home for the jewels and then more than likely be retired on the back end of that. So just important for punters to note when and if those markets are open. Party On will be coming home for the jewels, even though she is currently trained in Australia. She's won enough money that she can come home here and it's already qualified for them, Greg. Yeah, well, she's won 17 races and over $600,000, so it'd be great uh, to have her back here. Racing this week, uh, Field Marshal, who raced last week but was slightly disappointing, uh, it'll take on Franco Nelson. Tintanara, it's won over 100000 now, it just keeps on winning, will be in a race, the Ranji Bull, uh, with a Piccadilly Princess amongst other arrivals. So uh, that's the latest in terms of across the Tasman. What about here in New Zealand this week? What can you look forward to? Marawatu, well, Michael House and Blair Orange. Half a dozen for Michael House, 30 for the season. Uh, they'll line up at Marawatu on Thursday night, and Blair drove five winners there 
uh, on Tuesday. Uh, Addington have a bonus quaddy, 11 races there, 516 the first uh, kicks off and uh, the first of those quaddies will be race number two of course and we've also got uh, a bonus early quaddy at Alexandra Park so a quaddy fest there, $25,000 pick six uh, with fast track insurance and the Franklin Country Cup $17,000 there, 5 past 10 will be the start of that. Winton, it's their business's uh, cup pace and uh, 11 40 for the 11 race program there, so plenty of numbers still in the south and uh, looking forward to that program. And Methven on Sunday, 11 races there, 11.22 to kick things off, $25,000 pick six and a big day for the owners there. Uh, they're really putting it on for uh, the owners uh, of the day, featuring the Woodland Stud uh, Mount Hutt Cup. There's uh, special privileges there, they've got uh, uh, a nice uh, uh, array of food and beverage for you, heaps of activities. They've also got a competition there of who's the best, uh, ranking the top uh, 10 horses trained out of Meth and Michael over the years, the likes of Inky Lord, uh, Main Adios, Bachelor Star, Loyal Nurse, uh, Play On was in that area as well. So um, yeah, that's something a little bit interesting. Some really cool prizes there for anyone who uh, gets it right or gets closest to it, I suppose. But Methvin have always been pretty pretty innovative. They only race half a dozen times a year or thereabouts, and they're always thinking outside the square. Yeah, one of my favourite clubs. They do a wonderful job for harness racing. It's great we have a track where there's no gallopers on it. I think it's good for the track there. Just talking about Mid-Canterbury, Greg, um, it's obviously such a stronghold for harness racing. Last year they had the first Legends Day at Ashburton. It's coming up again. It was a huge success last year. They had over 100 people involved. April 28th, in association with the meeting at Ashburton, uh, if you've been involved in harness racing there before and you want to get along and have a cup of tea or a beer and catch up with your mates, um, it's on again. So contact either Simon Adlam, Carl Markham, Peter Larkin or Ricky May or anybody involved in harness racing down there. Big day to get together and sometimes you miss your mates and people pass on in life. It's a chance to get together, have a natter, talk horses, have a bet probably have a beer. I don't doubt there'll be too many cups of tea, Grego. That's April 28th. Get a hold of those fellas if you want to be part of their Legends Day. And well done to Ashburton for getting everybody together. Yep, looking forward to that and Methvin this week. Uh, monumental, Michael. That's the only way I can describe our effort last week. I think it's probably the first time we've ever both got uh, the multi up in terms of our best bet of the week. Speeding Spur, he got the business done for you. And Lelivra's Gift, so a couple of trotters uh, meant if you multi those, uh, those two up, she was a nice old return. Well, let's be honest, Greg, I probably didn't deserve to win. Ingheim should have beaten my horse, but the money's there for those who took the shorts. Well done to you, mate. You picked a $6 winner. And uh, this week, I've gone for the Lone Ranger. I just think it's in the right race. And Ben Butcher has really matured as a driver. So in a North Island junior driver's race, I reckon he's worth a couple of lengths, Greg. Won't have to wait too long. Race two, it's part of that early bonus quaddy at Alexandra Park. Semi Rami Day was a little bit unlucky on the Premier Night last week. Gets into a far easier field, I think. Uh, uh, second row draw, but I don't know that that will matter too much. So, um, yeah, looking forward to uh, uh, her getting win number one in her career. She's been placed behind some smarties. Uh, Cambridge Shahana's Jewels, of course, uh, this season, they are relaying the track there. And we've got some, uh, or one piece of. Uh, uh, camera work there for you about vision, that's the word I was looking for. Uh, John Denton and his team working very hard to uh, relay the surface there and get Cambridge uh, as fast as it possibly can for what should be another uh, terrific edition of the Harness Jewels. They've got some cool things happening around it as well, including the box seat will be there live on the Wednesday evening. There's a show on the Friday, which you're going to be part of, Michael, and Peter Moody will be the special guest, uh, a very humorous uh, trainer uh, of the, the mighty Mare and Black Caviar and uh, I think he'll be a great addition. Uh, he loves the horse, let alone which coat it's in, it doesn't matter. He'll add a lot, I think. He's a long-time harness racing fan, um, so he is coming across. I'm sure he'll catch up with his galloping friends there too. I think Cambridge need to engage the galloping community. Greg, it's a huge galloping part of the world and there's no northern gallops meeting that weekend so it's a great chance to say to the galloping boys and girls we'll come to the trots have a day out or come to the function on the friday night 320 ton of new sand and crusher dust put on the track so i think it's appropriate it hasn't been resurfaced since 96 greg it's a good thing for the jewels possible news there could be a lot of australian horses coming with been down that road before and been disappointed I think it's easier, Greg, to get them at Cambridge. And most important for Cambridge, there's a lot of talk about who's going to host the jewels heading forward. 
Uh, Ashburton, could it go to Addington? Cambridge, could it go to Alexandra Park? I think Cambridge need a really good jewels, Greg, this time around to maintain their hosting rights, in my belief. Uh, Yep, I think you're right too, Michael. And next week's show, of course, uh, your idea. Uh, we've put it uh, in their words. We've got around the country and talked to a number of the leading participants, not just trainers and drivers, but uh, other individuals, breeders, administrators. And uh, one of those questions is, should the jewels remain uh, in the country or should it be uh, in, in the towns, presumably Alexandra Park in Auckland and uh, Addington? Uh, in Canterbury. So that's one of the questions and I can tell you already Michael some very interesting answers not only to that one but to a few of the others as well. Yeah nice chance next week to give the people involved in the industry their chance to discuss some of the issues. Um, hopefully you can join us next week for the box seat in their words. Gregory it's been nice not to have you in the studio. I've got my own little domain here but uh, next week <laughs> we'll hand that domain over to the industry participants. Next week, a special box seat coming up 8.30 on Trackside 1. Yeah, I haven't missed you at all either, Michael. Uh, I was going to say, we'll see you next week. We won't. We'll see you in a fortnight. Even better. Uh, hope you enjoy your harness racing week ahead. Good evening.